Hello, it's my pleasure to um, welcome you all to this panel discussion today. We are here to talk about a project which not only very close to my heart, but is a project that is essential to the British Fashion Council's mission to create a circular fashion economy in the UK. The pandemic has further highlighted the need to rethink, reset and reorient business processes if we've got any chance of meeting the climate targets set out in the Paris Agreement. I think we all agree that we've got to act now. And of course, is that we have COP26 now scheduled for November this year, which will allow us as an industry to focus on how we embark on this decade of change and what we must, we must focus on um, in terms of bringing together businesses, like-minded people. And of course, that is very much the role of the British Fashion Council is the convening power to bring together industry to help make that change. A circular fashion industry is one which is, of course, where waste and pollution is designed out, uh, where products and materials are kept in use for as long as possible. And one of the things this project, of course, is going to be looking at is how we extend the life, recycle and reuse in a much better way within the UK. There are many London Fashion Week designers that have circular principles at their heart and their businesses, uh, from the likes of Christopher Rayburn to Bethany Williams, are uh, a fantastic light and inspiration for many others and young designers coming through to do the same. Last year, the British Fashion Council launched the Institute of Positive Fashion, uh, which if I refer to as IPF, is that it has become the name internally it's known as. Um, and that's really helped us drive towards this goal of a more responsible fashion industry. There are three pillars of the IPF, environment, people and community and craftsmanship. So today we have an esteemed panel that has come together to discuss the IPF Circular Fashion Ecosystem Project. It's an inaugural project for the IPF, so uh, incredibly important and exciting for us. The programme uh, will work with industry, academia and government to inform and implement change. And uh, the focus is, um, well, to accelerate an industry-wide ability for textile recycling uh, in the UK, to make the UK a major fashion revalue centre within the global industry, and to influence consumer behaviours into adopting responsible consumption habits. This research project is made possible by founding partners of the IPF, which are Vanish and DHL, so a big thank you to you for your support. And uh, without further ado, let me introduce the brilliant panel that we have for this roundtable discussion today. So we have Alan Wheeler, Director of Textile Recycling Association. Dr. Alex Hetherington, a circular economy lead at Three Keel, who are leading on this research project. Cindy Rose, founder of Warn Again Technologies. Dax Lovegrove, independent sustainability advisor, formerly of Swarovski, Kingfisher, WWF, and also on our steering committee for the IPF. Uh, Jalaj Hora, VP Product Innovation and Consumer Creation at Nike. Uh, Jalaj also sits on our IPF steering committee. Franz von Bismarck Austin, who's Senior um, Director of Sector Development and Etel and Fashion at DHL. And Sonia Timia, who's Head of Sustainable Brands and Customer Partnerships at Vanish Reckitt Benkiza. Uh, if I got that wrong or I said anything uh, that I shouldn't have, is that please feel free to um, update as and when um, we go through. So I'm going to get on without further ado uh, with some questions to really kickstart the discussion. Um, I guess this is the first question that uh, I wanted to probably put to maybe Sonia first is, uh, so what solutions do you believe a circular economy delivers for our planet and for our society? Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's great. Thank you for that. And it's a great question to kick us off. And I think it's a really timely one because I think when most people think about the circular economy, the focus is very much on the first part of that around the planet piece. And not surprisingly, really, how the circular economy was framed around moving from a linear take, make, break, dispose to something that's more circular, where those materials, energy, chemicals that you mentioned are actually kept in the system. The focus was on reducing waste. How do we lower our impact on the environment? And this is so relevant for the fashion sector. So in the UK, every year, we dispose of 300,000 tonnes of waste, clothing waste, into landfill. And increasingly, the connection between the circular economy and climate change is also being recognized. So the Ellen MacArthur Foundation says that if we move to more circular pathways, then we could reduce carbon emissions in Europe by 50% by 2030. That's huge. So that planet part of it, I think, is very well recognized. But I think if we just focus on that, we're missing a trick. Because the other part you mentioned is society. Now, that 300,000 tons of clothing 
the landfill represents 140 million pounds in terms of value. Can you imagine what we could do if we kept that value in the economy, recycled it, so to speak? And when we're talking about recycling, and it's a circular economy is much wider than that, it's about what new industries do we need to innovate for to drive that circularity? How do we give boost to existing industries like recycling? And what that does is it boosts job creation, as well as delivers some real social economic benefits, which we need to recognize as well. So I think that contribution you talked about, absolutely, it's writ large from a planet perspective in terms of reducing waste, impacts on land, the link to climate change. But I think increasingly, we also need to link up what it means to us from a societal perspective as well. Thank you, Sonia. And I think that sort of new skills and job piece is uh, certainly one of the things that we've been talking about is one of the great opportunities that's going to come from this. Um, Alex, I wonder if I can throw to you next. Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, a, you know, fantastic answer there. And, and I echo many of those, those themes that uh, Sonia's just mentioned. I mean, circular economy, to me, I mean, it's about doing more with less, uh, you know, decoupling the, the economic growth from consumption. And, you know, one of the ways that, that's really important to do that is embracing the best of the old as well as going for the new. I mean, we're all pretty familiar with reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, you know, actually, you know, our parents and grandparents were very familiar with some of those, those activities and we need to sort of bring those back. Um, so it's a different way of thinking. But it's also a different way of thinking in terms of, you know, the innovation as well. You know, in addition to the reduce, reuse, recycle, we've got, you know, rethink, redesign, re-innovate, reimagine, remanufacture. All of these things that really are intrinsically required for moving towards circular solutions. And I mean, just to, to sort of build on, you know, what Sonia and, and yourself were saying about the jobs, all of this, you know, really builds a, an economy that, that does create jobs as well. There's been you know, a recent report from RAP and Green Alliance that estimate that in the UK alone, moving towards circular economy uh, type models would increase jobs by around 200,000 to half a million by, 20, by 2030. You know, it's quite a significant boost. Um, so, so yes, the main message to me is, you know, embracing the old as well as going for the new, but trying to make more from less. Fantastic, thank you. And I think that innovation is one of the things that um, sort of themes that we've been looking at uh, as the opportunity again, uh, as we start to look at the interventions uh, that this research might bring. Um, Absolutely. Alan, is that, can I ask you for your perspective, is that uh, as someone who's right at the heart of recycling, is that would love to hear from you. Uh, of, of course, and one of the perils of uh, being the third person <laughs> to be asked the question is that a lot of the really good answers have gone already. <laughs> I suppose, you know, for, you, you mentioned obviously the Paris Accord um, that we got to meet and obviously the, the, uh, the COP meeting is taking place in Glasgow in November, we hope. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the, one of the big issues obviously is the climate uh, impact of the fashion industry. So that kind of highlights, you know, one of the reasons why we really must do, must take that action. So it's something like 10% of all global greenhouse gas emissions are attributed to the fashion industry in some way and another thing I find quite interesting is is that um, it's estimated that around 20% of all uh, pollution of fresh water is is caused by the fashion industry and now that I find astonishing and very worrying but that that in itself creates opportunities on the recycling side currently we have a situation where actually what what we are driven by is the the value of used clothing so although we call ourselves textile recyclers we're about targeting the, um, the, the existing uh, intrinsic value in the used clothing. And that is a good thing. It's, I, I make no apologies for, for um, you know, keeping clothes for, for in, long, for in use as long as possible. And I think um, you know, the fact that we are selling it into markets is actually a really good thing. And rather than try and challenge that, we should try to embrace it. Um, but the, there, are, there are some issues that we clearly need to tackle. I would like to see, rather than um, talking about necessarily just, oh, we must create uh, textile manufacturing jobs, let's change that man mantra to textile recycling manufacturing jobs. If we're sending clothing to Africa to, for, for reuse, why can't we you know, get them to produce fibers that are made from recycled fibers uh, or, or products made from recycled fibers there? I think you know, we need to challenge ourselves in those particular areas, but also, at the moment, we are currently sending most of our stuff uh, when we are recycling it into mechanical recycling processes, which are very good. 
actually, I would have to say, if you send your clothing uh, to be pulled and used in the manufacture of um, uh, insulation, for example, that will last the lifetime of uh, that insulation material. It will last the lifetime of the building. It will have a very good LCA. The problem is, is that these markets are limited and we need to be developing new markets for recycling. We need to be developing uh, new processes and you know we need to be expanding uh, the chemical recycling processes uh, that, has been, that are being produced by the likes of Ward again and we need to look at ways in which we can do that and there are potentially many job creation opportunities associated with that. I think that's um, really important to understand isn't it I think in this past year where we've seen sadly some of our traditional manufacturing um, disappear is that the opportunity to build back in those communities because those jobs and those opportunities within communities throughout the UK have played such a fantastic role in uh, contributing to local and national economy. Okay, so um, Cindy, I'm gonna come to you next, I think, is that uh, I think we all understand that this isn't a, a short-term fix um or um change indeed and that um there are many stakeholders obviously that have to play a key role so we'd love to hear from you and sort of your thoughts around who those are um and who can really cut with do we need to bring together to enable real transformation um over this next 10 years which is essential for us to hit as this decade of change yeah no it's a very good question and uh, not a one word answer in terms of, you know, who needs to be involved. It's, it's everyone around the circular value chain from brands and retailers to the production supply chain, uh, the post-consumer textile collectors and sorters, the reuse and repair businesses, mechanical and regenerative recycling processes. They're, they're all needed in this system of change and I think the key is figuring out well what's possible today and where do we want to end up in the future and then once we understand what that vision looks like or, or you know the end goal of where we want to get to we can figure out the stepping stones for getting there and prioritize what needs to happen in the short term and I think that's where government can come in and play a very valid role in terms of implementing policy change that actually supports that timeline and that phase to circularity. Because certainly what we need today is going to be very different than what we need in, in five years time. And I think as Alan was saying, you know, the potential of regenerative recycling technologies to then um, build on what mechanical recycling is able to do today is going to make a huge change in, in and, and open up a whole range of opportunities, um, as Sonia was talking about as well with uh, the economics and Alex as well, the economics of this, I don't think we talk enough about it and we need to be more tangible about what that's gonna look like because everyone can win from this. It's not about doing less, it's about actually doing more. It's about all of these stakeholders getting involved and understanding what their role is in making it happen. So definitely education, awareness, and an action plan that everyone can get involved with. Fantastic, great answer. Um, Dax, I know that this is a, we talk about this a lot on our steering um, committee meetings. So uh, we'd love you to share your perspective. We do. Um, thank you, Caroline. And, and really just adding to Cindy's remarks, um, I mean, I think one group of stakeholders are the big clothing retailers. Uh, and I think at the IPF, you know, what we've seen is that uh, the top 10 clothing retailers are responsible for something like 40% of the apparel market. So if those players can really, uh, you know, have a role in this, uh, they can really help to accelerate the circular economy. And I think it's going beyond using recycled content and, and producing recyclable fashion items. It's, it's also offering, offering, you know, take back services and, and new kinds of um, models. Um, so I think the big players, the big clothing retailers is definitely one. Um, designers, as we've all said already, you know, small and large, if they are really knowledgeable and, and skilled and equipped to rethink how they design and redesign for circularity and design out waste, um, they can play a huge part as well. Um, the other people are, we always think about are the disruptors. 
and the, the re-commerce economy, you know, the, the, the people offering resale and rental services, uh, rent the runway and uh, um, my wardrobe and those sorts of players, you know, the more we can learn from those incredible innovators who are changing the marketplace and, and making fashion more circular. And um, that would be, you know, really quite incredible. And then finally, just the universities, and, and we see them uh, very active already, but really making sure that the next generation of designers and fashion brands coming through um, know about this and they know how to think about different kinds of alternative materials and uh, new sorts of techniques to uh, accelerate this whole agenda. Thank you. Um, Alan, what more can we do? Is that there's a, a lot obviously there in terms of how we can all do more to contribute to uh, the recycling and upcycling. But um, from your perspective, is that what are your priorities in that sense? Sorry to come to you third on that. But. No, that, that's quite all right. And, and Dax just listed so many of the different stakeholders that I think we need to uh, engage with. And I'm very glad, and I wrote this down, Cindy, because I can never remember the term you use. It's not chemical recycling, it's regenerative recycling. So I'm going to try and remember that now. Um, you know, from our point of view, I think where we are, where we need to be going, going forward is um, going to be driven by the need to be ambitious. Um, so um, I think if we just kind of stay with that, well, we'll do what we can kind of thing. I, I think that that will hold things back. I really would like to see what other countries are actually doing at the moment. And that is setting ambitious targets for including recycled content. Now, I appreciate that there are other aspects of the circular economy and we're not able to reach those things, th those targets yet. But if we have, say, a, a target to include 30% recycled content by 2025, 50% by 2030, that I think will encourage, uh, you know, investment and innovation in these areas and will help to stimulate the market. So that's really, you know, from the speaking as a recycler representative, that's what I would like to see. Fantastic. Caroline, um, sorry, yeah. can I just add one point to that? I think we've all missed someone uh, or a key stakeholder that's really integral to all of this, which is the facilitators, the industry groups that are bringing all of these um, siloed components together. I think they play an absolute integral role in inconvening. And without that, without that collaboration, no one's going to achieve circularity on their own. So um, yes, another vote in there for, for the conveners and, and especially um, groups like this and what we're launching today. Absolutely. And yeah. I think as we get um, get ready for COP26 and think about, you know, the commitments that will be made later this year is that all of those different organizations that have that convening power, whether it's G7 Fashion Pact, UNFCCC Fashion Charter, you know, there are many, is that the, you know, I think demonstrating how all of those are collaborating, sharing knowledge, information um, is incredibly powerful. And, um, and I think sort of that insight that we're getting from all of those other organizations allows us to focus on areas that maybe they're not looking at as well. So um, I, was saying, I, was, I was just going to yeah. add in there, if I may, because I, I was thinking exactly the same, Cindy, as you know, you're quite right when you said, you know, this, it's not a one word answer. And to hear the, the list of stakeholders, I completely agree. And I think one of the absolute key things that, that we need and we're going to see is the power of collaboration and the power of you know such such schemes whereby you know exactly that the you know top 10 responsible for 40 percent we need a collaborative view and a collaborative effort in, to, in order to get that transformation alex you kind of took the words out of my mouth and i was <laughs> there going there, there's something yeah. i think there's something about all the different stakeholders doing what they have to do but really to drive the scale that we need it needs collaboration and partnership absolutely and, and, yeah, and this is where we need to be a bit bold. We need to partner with types of organizations we haven't partnered with before. So Dad yeah. mentioned the top 10, instead of each one of the top 10 doing their own thing, why don't we do one thing that is greater than the sum of our individual parts? So I think Absolutely. the whole piece around partnership and collaboration within a sector, cross sector is going to be absolutely key for us to join the dots, but also to scale the kind of impact we can have. Yeah. Jalaj, I'd love to come to you next just to hear from um, your perspective, because you've worked in many big brands currently at Nike, is that how, you know, sort of how impactful um, is a circular fashion economy in helping us really think about meeting those targets? And, um, and what do you see as the opportunities? 
Thank you, Caroline. I think it's a great question. Uh, I, I often wonder if we don't meet the challenge, what's the alternative? You know, is it 2.4 degrees centigrade change by 2030 and five degrees by 2050? Will humanity survive that extreme change? So I think the challenge is, is systemic and, and, and not to be uh, underestimated. So when we start talking about circularity, I think it's, it's important to fundamentally start thinking from reforming agriculture and forestry, how we grow, how we farm, and how much waste is generated there. Uh, talk about electrification and how uh, transportation buildings, industries today are getting their energy supplies adapting our operations to becoming less wasteful uh, and becoming more resource efficient, decarbonizing power and fuel. Uh, so I do think that there is a massive opportunity and, and as the discussion uh, in the previous conversation about collaboration being critical, we are facing a problem of the commons. And it is only through collaboration that we'll be able to address this challenge. I also think that we have to get out of the mode of doing less harm and get into the mode of doing more good. So as we start rethinking uh, as the economy bounces back, I think it's critical not just to have a dialogue on recyclability, reusability, but also about serviceability, upgradability, fashion as a service model uh, in order to start stepping up to the challenge. So I, I do think that there's a huge impact that our industry can make in mitigating uh, the impact of uh, climate change. I mean, that's a significant uh, shift in mindset for a lot of businesses, isn't it? To rethink that way. And for us all as individuals, I think, is that um, a very good challenge to lay down there is that you talked a little bit, obviously, about um, electrification. And so I'd love to come to Franz to maybe uh, give us your perspective uh, from a DHL perspective and uh, from, I guess, your sector servicing the fashion industry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Caroline, and thanks for the great question. I fully agree with uh, with uh, Jalash, and I think you know we have we have all the insights of all the flows of of many of the fashion brands really coming you know in this one way in ocean freight and air freight to warehouses to the consumer, and we see you know obviously we see also quite a lot of reverse logistics from customers shipping something back, but this is for the wrong reasons, right? I think we need to think about, or the, the, the whole industry needs to think about how can we change the business models? And I think, um, yeah, Dex pointed it out and Jalash as well. I think we really need to find a way of keeping the, the actual products longer in the loop, actually. Um, and, and, and not, because even if we recycle all of what is out there, it, it will not be enough. So we need to um, extend actually the, the, the product life cycle. And I guess, I mean, we ask ourselves the same question, like what role can we play here? And I think we need to, we need really to leverage our experience as logistics company and, you know, collecting goods from consumers, collecting goods from shops, you know, how to, uh, you know, transport it back to warehouses, how to recycle it. We need to use that knowledge that we have really to, to help the brands in the industry actually to, to really come up with these business models. Because whenever we talk to them, one of the biggest problem is really the supply chain of how to get all of it back, how to convince the consumer to really, you know, drop it off actually and um, um, transport it somewhere. So how can we build a model that is cost effective, um, that can really allow an effective reverse logistics? So that is really what we are discussing and that what what we're working on, what we're trying to, to do. And um, again, we need to do it with the whole industry, with all the brands, with all of you, um, how, how this can be done, because it's not a, not a one man's or one company's job. Thanks, Franz. Um, Dats, I'm gonna to throw to you because 
you get very excited when we're talking about new business models that might come through as we approach a more circular fashion economy. So we'd love your thoughts. I do get overexcited <laughs> by that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's the hardest part to do because we can all, um, you know, use our resources in better ways. We can do business a bit better. But if, if we fundamentally need to shift into a circular economy, that, that, as you said, Caroline, it means businesses have to really rethink what they, they do. And if you're a retailer or any sort of fashion business, you, you, your systems, your finance systems, your delivery systems, your stores, um, your 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 e-commerce sites they're geared up for selling things and that's the way we are all conditioned um, and so to 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 get in shape for a new kind of way of doing things to to provide a, a service model to provide a, um, a a different kind of way of providing fashion that that does require a massive rethink and, and none of us think this is an easy thing to do uh, it's a long game but I think the real smart companies out there will learn from the disruptors and they will start to make sure that their stores and their finance systems and their delivery systems and whatever else it is start to adjust and adapt and, and realign so that they can get into a very, very different model. In future, we, as, as Jalaj and others have said, fashion may well be a service. We, we may ne not see products in the future, might we? So it would be fascinating to see that as the, as the future. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, and Alan, is that, how does the, sort of your part of the industry and the recycling, how does that fit into the new models and uh, the way that we might think in the future? Well, that's, a, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, I suppose for us, it's about, um, you know, from, from our point of view, um, our role is obviously uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're driven by keeping products in use as long as possible. And I think that there is still a role for us to be playing in terms of collecting it and sending it to, to the markets, um, you know, where where the demand is is needed for it. But um, yeah, it, it for me, it, it's, it's all about really the future has to lie with, um, you know, developing, developing the new markets, developing the new applications. But also, actually, we do have experience of already in delivering uh, retail take back schemes anyway so um, I think that there's discussions to be had perhaps with um, you know some of the bigger retailers who are looking into this area um, you know I, I personally you know have implemented um, you know my own um, uh, retail take back scheme about 15 years ago before anyone else does it and it's still going today but I'm not going to mention the name of the the, the well-known uh, fashion brand that uh, that does it because they like to keep quiet about these things but, but you see, there are plenty of opportunities there to, to kind of, you know, if you like, um, I say, I'm saying square the circle, but actually make the line circular, which is what we're really trying to sort of drive towards. So I, I, I think that's really for us what the big issue is. When I think all of these comments and uh, insights and questions uh, is what's led us to really get ready to do this piece of research, hasn't it? But I would love to hear from all of you, actually, is that uh, why you think it's so important and why now? Cindy, I'm going to come to you first, I think. Yes, another big question um, with lots of answers. Um, well, I think when we, when we talk about moving from today's model of production and consumption, to this ideal circular future, um, you know, with today less than 1% of end of use textiles going back into new textiles and moving to a model where the majority of end of use textiles eventually get broken down into raw materials to become new textiles. Like this shift that needs to happen there and the amount of collaboration, the, the adaptation of existing infrastructure that Franz pointed out so elegantly around reverse logistics. Like there is an entire re-engineering of the system to be done, um, which is going to take years. And, um, and, and I think the research that can underpin it, that can provide a roadmap for that and guide um, different stakeholders is is really really relevant and I think one example is around you know Alan was talking about how we collect our textiles today and send a lot for reuse to African countries which is great we want to keep that reuse in existence um, but when we start moving to more regional circular 
um, models of production and consumption. I mean, we're gonna be able to start reprocessing uh, those materials closer to home, getting them back into supply chains. And that's, that's really gonna need a shift in, you know, the way we collect, the way we sort, moving from, you know, highly intensive labor for sorting textiles by hand and by eye to highly mechanized systems that can separate textiles by fiber content. There will be other technologies and, and approaches coming into it like product and material ID. I mean, there's so many different innovations and disruptions that, that will come into play that we need to unpick it and start creating a story that makes it simple pe for people to, to grasp and tangible steps for doing that. So really excited about this piece of work and, and what it's going to uncover. And then finally, just to say, we need to feed that into the other initiatives that are you know, like Textiles 2030 that are taking place. So everyone's got their part to play in it and we build on what's happening in each of these groups. Can, can I interject there? Because I thought of something yeah. when, when Cindy was uh, talking there. I think what we need to do is also recognize the challenges. So actually, although, you know, yes, uh, I think it was Sonia who said we got 300,000 tons of, of clothing going into waste every year. Um, the reality is that actually as, as a country, uh, we are actually pretty good at reusing clothing and collecting clothing. In fact, we have, we have the highest collection rate uh, in the world per head of population, but we also are pretty good at consuming fast fashion. But, but the, and, and similarly, most of Northwestern Europe is pretty good but at, at uh, collecting, but actually the rest of the world is, is a long way behind us. Um, and so we need to recognize that if, if, we, if we as a country improve our circular economy, other countries will be wanting to do the same thing and that needs to, be, that needs to happen. And as it stands, we will not be able to use the existing markets if everyone is collecting the same volumes that we are collecting. So just as an example, um, which really serves to highlight this, um, until about five or six years ago, um, China was nowhere near, uh, no, didn't feature anywhere in terms of uh, as, a, as a key player in the used clothing market. It it's, uh, was accounting for I think 0.68% of value of all used clothing exports. Now, within a very, very short time, it has become the fourth biggest exporter of used clothing in the world. It is still collecting a tiny fraction of the potential amount of used clothing that it could in China. And yet it has already made significant inroads into particularly the East African markets, but also the West African markets. We're, we're being squeezed out by the Chinese. So that's one country collecting a tiny fraction of clothing and they will need to collect more as will every other country. And, that, and, and, we, it, and of course that, it's welcome that they are collecting it, but that brings itself challenges. We will not be able to continue, every, it won't be possible for everyone to be continue uh, exporting into the same markets that we are. And so therefore it just really serves to highlight how important it is that we develop this circular economy uh, and that we develop um, these new markets, these very much needed new markets and these new applications. And if we can get people to, uh, producers to, to uh, start producing clothing with recycled content, uh, recognizing the limitations that there are at the moment, but it really would be fantastic. Brilliant, thank you, Alan. I'm actually gonna come to you, Jalaj, because that, that's sort of almost a challenge to industry, isn't it? Is that how we could do more to use the recycled clothing and put it back into the system? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a really important question. Why and why now? And I think that there's a very uh, simple answer, but a rather complex solution. The planet is demanding it and we owe it to our future generations to do it. But I can tell you coming from inside the industry that circularity is not missing from the industry for the lack of desire to be circular. It's missing because the foundational elements of circular thinking, circular design, uh, are just not there yet. And we have a very unique opportunity 
to get a head start and, and set the standards in the world. So, so not only is there a huge opportunity in terms of leading in R&D, in terms of responding to the huge unemployment challenge, but I think uh, there's an opportunity to then take it and socialize it to a great part of, of the planet uh, through the discovery work that we'll do. Thanks, Dilaj. Um, and picking up on one of the things that Cindy said around, it's really about getting all audiences involved, is that I think one of the unique pieces of this research is that it's also looking about how we engage the consumer in the conversation, because they, you know, it's not just as business, but all of us as individuals and consumers of fashion have to really think about our role too. Um, so Sonia, is that you're um, helping us with that. So I'm going to throw to you for the, maybe pick up on that point. Thank you, Caroline. And actually, that's exactly what I was going to talk about, which is about the consumer viewpoint, not surprisingly. Uh, and actually, you, you mentioned, so please correct me if I haven't got that right. It, it is slightly different. I'm the head of sustainable brands for RB and Vanish is one of our yeah. most loved brands in their whole portfolio. But I think it's also our way through to understanding the consumer insight on clothing. Um, and I think over the years, what I've seen is a growing recognition of the problems that we face. Many of you have talked about it. Yeah, the environmental footprint of clothing is well known now. The fact that fashion emits more carbon than international maritime and airlines combined on a national basis, it's huge, right? We, we, know, we know the statistics. It is about filtering some of this information down as well. So as part of Vanish, we do a fair bit of consumer insight, not just to understand about Vanish and how people use our products, but what are their views on things like fashion, clothing, how they use it, how does it change over time? And actually one of the things we've seen is a real shift through COVID actually. So pre-COVID, we asked a bunch of questions around people's views on fashion and awareness on the environmental impact was actually relatively low. We did the same survey at the end of last year and actually there was a massive shift. So two thirds of people recognize that fashion has a significant footprint on the planet. And this comes back to what Jalaj was saying, which is this recognition that there is this footprint is also starting to drive consumer behavior to trying to do something about it. And that's the shift that we now see. So one of the things I'm really excited about with this project is the focus on consumer behavior, because I think there's a huge opportunity here to inspire people to think about how they buy, wear, use, and then pass on clothes to drive this circularity that we've been talking about. And you know, if we look at some of the stats around, we, Again, as part of the research, we found that if you look at 18 to 34 year olds, yeah, about 40% of them only want to wear a piece of clothing once for a special occasion. That's, that's incredible. And yeah, when you think about information like that, I think it's also a huge opportunity. And I think there's more work to be done, not just to understand behavior, but to understand what levers can we pull to drive positive behavior towards more sustainable fashion. And I think this research project one part of it is going to help inform just how we do that. And the second thing is, I think it comes back to the point around collaboration as well. I think it will help us establish the frameworks that will allow us to drive some of this collaboration to drive the consumer behavior change with retailers, with brands like ours. We're in millions of households every day. And that's an amazing route through which we can try and inspire this behavior change in a much more sustainable direction. Brilliant, thank you. And Franz, to you, because obviously as DHL works with so many partners in the fashion industry. So for, for you, why uh, this research project and why now? Yeah, I think we've, we've seen over the years, of course, already a lot of buzz around circular uh, economy, but really around last year, it really you know, came to the next stage. And, and a lot of um, customers and brands we're working with, they demanded, to, to rethink the whole the whole model actually and to 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 really think out of the box and that also made us actually think about okay what what can we contribute to the overall topic and Sonia uh, great that you mentioned the the con consumer uh, impact and uh, surprisingly we we also find this in a, in a slightly different way around packaging which is also closely linked to to, to fashion, but also here we we getting more and more demand actually of why do we need that type of packaging to the retailer, but also to us as a logistics company. Uh, can we have it in a different way? Can we use it without packaging? So it just shows really the awareness of the consumer that is that is really grown, but also from the industry. And I think 
that together from the both ends really sets the time now of, of this research. And I think it's, it's, it's actually perfect timing to really come together and to, to rethink the whole model. Fantastic. Well, that is the end of our what went very quickly uh, discussion um, and uh, setting up very nicely for our research. Alex, I think you have a task in hand, I think, to collect everybody's views, to get the international uh, insight um, and some really big challenges there for us to really think the role that we play as individuals, you know, a completely new mindset, uh, a re-engineering of the system. Um, but, you know, as Jalaj reminded us, the reason why we're doing it is protecting our planet for the future and future generations. And the, oppor uh, and the opportunity is huge. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting time to be embarking on this and, and a terrific project. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for your time today. Thank you all for getting involved in the IPF and in this research project in particular, and very much looking forward to sharing um, some of the first findings of the research a little bit later this year. Thank you all so much.